All right, and sitting down with us today for the podcast, we've got Memorial Cup champion with the London Knights, NHL defenseman, and Brookfield High School legend, Mark Mathot. Mark, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great, Kyle. Good to be here. Yeah, well, I mean, I had to mention the Brookfield thing because, uh, as I'm sure you know, there, your brother and I had a brief stint coaching the uh, Brookfield basketball teams together there. So uh, every day <laughs> walk into practice, we would see your uh, your plaque up on their athletic wall of fame. And, and I got to figure, you know, NHL career is nice. Memorial Cup's nice there. But clearly the pinnacle of your athletic achievement is getting your face up on your high school wall. And you know, it's funny, I totally forgot it was even there. So this is sort of news to me again. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there you go. So, I, I mean, are we going to see you relive like the, the Coach Gordon Bombay days here? And, you know, when you get a little bit older, you're going to go coach the scrappy young kids to a city title or what? I, no, I, I think it's funny you mentioned that. My wife and I are debating. We, have, we own a pretty big property out uh, in the west end of town, past Armprior, and uh, we're debating on buying a or rather we already own the land we're debating on building out there so my point is I might be coaching somewhere out in Renfrew County in the next couple of years when my son gets old enough so we'll see <laughs> yeah yeah so I mean well, that's kind of a good place to start really too because that, that that's sort of obviously where most young hockey players careers really start taking off is those teenage high school years when you're going whether it's you know WHL the Q OHL whatever and for you is the OHL I mean it's tough enough as a teenager to sort of juggle, you know, school, social life, all of that, just when you're just going to school. But when you're also going to be away from home, there's lots of travel, the demands of a season. What sort of sticks out to you now looking back on, on those high school years as far as your development as a player? That's a really good question. And it doesn't get talked about enough, especially for younger guys that are not really sure what to expect when they get into junior hockey. Um, from my experiences, at least when I, when I finally made the jump and moved out to London to play there and committed to that, it's, I just turned 17. Um, what an adjustment. I mean, you have, no one warns you about this, but just, just your everyday life at school, for example, is different. First of all, you're always tired. I mean, yeah. I, I can remember falling, asleep, maybe not falling asleep at the, uh, you know, on my desk, but pretty darn close. And that was just about every day because you're 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 going through changes. You're a late, you know, you're a teen, and you're um, you're playing a very intense, well, you know, arguably professional sport at this point. Um, you know, you're still playing in London. At least we were playing in front of nine thousand fans. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a huge adjustment that I feel like not a lot of guys are able to manage it perfectly. I I, I can't think of too many you know scholars that we had on our team in London. Some guys were doing fairly well in school, but for the most part, you're just tired all the time. And you're always worried about the next game or practice. And then you're juggling your academics in between. And it's, it's a tough thing to manage. And I, I feel like that doesn't really get spoken enough. And, uh, you know, like when you're grooming up players and talking to them leading into it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, you just mentioned practice there. And, you know, that 2005 team, you, you guys were absolutely loaded, right? Like normally a, a, a franchise is happy if they get one NHL out of it. And you guys ended up having 11 guys end up playing in the NHL just from that 2005 team. Yeah. You guys ended up getting named CHL team of the century in 2018. Forget games. What was just like a typical practice like for you guys when there's that much high end talent on the ice at the same time? It was like it was the best form of preparation for any guy that was planning on playing professionally afterwards. Right. Because you're playing at this very high intensity. You're practicing at a high intensity. Um, everyone's got a high standard for you out there, including the coaching staff. So passes always had to be on. Um, you had to be ready to go for every drill. It was just, it was the perfect uh, culture for any guy that was really looking to play and moving on to that next level in pro hockey. So um, we were highly competitive, but also very tight. We had all come up together roughly around the same time um, when we were all drafted together, like myself, that we had Kyle Quincy and Corey Perry and Danny Savret at the time, who was CHL Defenseman of the Year a couple of times. So um, we had a, we had a really strong group that came up together and we grew together and that just kind of gave us that much more of an advantage coming to our third or fourth year together uh, when we finally won the Memorial Cup it was it was a perfect storm yeah yeah I, I mean looking back on it now you, you sort of can obviously remember what they were like as teenagers and now here, here they are sort of coming towards maybe the end of their NHL careers there you know 
what, what was it like playing with, you know, a 16, 17 year old Corey Perry? Was he always sort of that, that super pest or is that something he oh, yeah. added to his game later on? That was, that was how he was that, like that, that is his true form. Um, and, and what amazes me is that he's still playing that way to this day. Um, you have to admire it. And um, what a dominant player. I mean, especially in junior, you can imagine a guy at his size. I mean, he was not exactly a, a speed skater, but still get got around pretty good, but, he played such a gritty style and wasn't afraid to get into the, those hard areas around the net. And that's what drew a lot of penalties for him too, right? And for us as a team, we got a ton of power plays because he was kind of a rat out there. <laughs> but at the same time, arguably the most skilled player on the ice, which is uh, a very dangerous combination, but we were happy to have him on our team. Yeah, yeah, obviously probably a little bit more fun to play with when he was on your team than against <laughs> when you uh, met him <laughs> a few years later. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, were, were you guys able to really sort of soak in the moments as that season was going on, knowing that, hey, we're doing something special here? Or was it not until sort of a, a few years down the line that you were able to actually look back on it and go, wow, that, that was a really incredible team that I was a part of? Yeah, it, it, it's hard to put words to it because during the during that time, especially at that age, mm -hmm. um, it just it's a blur. You know, it goes it goes by so quickly. And um I think we did, we were fortunate enough to have a lot of success right from the get-go. And, and even the season prior, we were the number one team in the CHL um, for the entire year almost. So um, we knew we had a really good team and we were already very confident going into that season in 2005. So um, to say that we never had the, you know, the chance to really enjoy it would be a lie. We certainly did. And we knew we had something special right from training camp, but once you get started and you get into that routine and you're so busy, right? Like with, with high school at the time and then moving into practice and just rinse and repeating every, every, every day. Um, it certainly makes things go very quickly, but um, what a story, uh, a storied season we had. And it's something that even to this day, you don't forget, you know, and, and, and you develop bonds with guys when you go through stuff like that. I mean, I, I can have a conversation with one of the boys that I played with that year and it would feel like we just picked up from where we left off. It, there would be no awkwardness. It's, it's really a, a weird thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, obviously it culminates with you guys actually winning the Memorial Cup there. D did it make it extra sweet, the fact that you guys were actually hosts that year and you were able to do it, yeah. it, it you know, at home? Yeah, and, 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 and beyond that, um, it was a lockout year in the NHL. Mm -hmm. So we had so much attention, so much media attention that year because of the damage we were doing around the league. We had like a 31 game undefeated streak during that season. So we already had the spotlight on us. Um, and, uh, and then obviously, you know, going into the Mem Cup, I just remember all the, um, all the NHL players, the ex NHL players, ex, you know, current and former guys that had come into London to watch the games and you could see them kind of rolling around a lot. And then you had all the scouts everywhere. Um, it was a, a high pressure intense tournament and and um you know if you can't manage that you probably have a bit of a hard time with it but i think because of all that attention that we had garnered throughout the year we were very prepared for it and uh, it made for a very entertaining tournament yeah yeah was it extra extra sweet to you know beat crosby's team in, in the final year <laughs> was that just sort of the cherry on top for you guys yeah and credit to sydney i mean the the entourage that he had around him all the time and all the uh um, all the attention he was getting. I mean, that kid didn't even get any privacy and he was only 17 at the time, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it was a testament to his character and the kind of guy he is. I mean, uh, I don't want to say he was carrying that team because they did have a couple other pretty big pieces that he was playing with at the time. Really, really good junior players as well. But I mean, without him, they, don't, they didn't stand a chance. And um, having played against him in that first game, I can still remember how strong he was on his skates. Uh, I remember taking a run at him in that first shift uh, I think I knocked his helmet off too, but he stood strong, barely budged. I mean, obviously taken back a little bit, but um, I realized then and there, I'm like, okay, this kid's pretty special. He's, I can understand now where everyone's coming from talking about him and just watching him control the play out there with what he had. So um, yeah, I got a hats off to him. He was great. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't hurt that he has absolute tree trunks for uh, legs holding them up there too. Eh? You almost, they're almost weird. It, yeah. It's almost, strange to see them they're so big uh, he carries so much power he's like a genetic freak almost he's obviously obviously he's got the hands and the uh um you know the, the, the mind out there to, to read the place properly but i mean physically he's he's gifted as well yeah 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 well i, I was gonna say you know 
fast forward to uh, your NHL days there, and obviously you had a little bit of a run in with him in, in 2017 there. Do, do you think that, uh, you know, that, that that's his, his motive for that slash there was, okay, here, here's, here's the uh, payback for that Memorial Cup that you guys cost me there. And I don't know. I, it was <laughs> It was an accident, clearly. I mean, I'd, I'd look, I'd watched it over and over and over. And, you know, maybe it was a little reckless in terms of just going for the hands or just trying to reach out. Or maybe it was, a, maybe he was tired and he was lazy and he was just trying to slash me. Yeah. But just it was the perfect angle where he caught me on my glove and it sliced right through my finger. And that was, I was angry for a while, obviously. And, and, and because it put me through so much pain and discomfort. Yeah. And to this day, I don't even have full sensation in my, in my pinky finger anymore. So, um, you know, he's left me with a scar and I can't blame him for it. It was obviously just an accident and a, and a freak play. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, how is the finger these days there? Did, did it end up scarring up or you got most of the mobility back to it or? It's mobility, but it, it's just, I don't have all that sensation back. Right. So, um, he cut right through it. It was hanging by a thread, literally by a little bit of tissue and the doctors did a great job sewing it back on. And it was a 50, 50 chance that it would take, uh, and it took okay. Um, but it still doesn't feel the same. Yeah, yeah. Well, so your hand modeling career is, is out the window. Then. <laughs> I'm not a hand model, that's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. So, yeah. I, I mean, moving on, you, you end up getting drafted, obviously, by, by Columbus there, and huge moment in any young player's life is hearing their name get called there. And obviously not just special for you, but special for the family as well, too. Yeah. I, I'm always curious, what were, what were mom and dad doing when, you know, they finally saw your name get called? Were, were they phoning every relative known to mankind? Were they, you know, weeping uncontrollably? They playing it cool? What, what was their reaction? It's funny. It's a funny story. At the time, I don't know if it's still like this in the draft, but they would only do the, the first I think it was the first three rounds on the Friday mm -hmm. and then they go from round four to nine I think it was on Saturday so all I can remember was the Friday going by round obviously I knew I wasn't going in the first or second round or I didn't I didn't I didn't assume anything mm -hmm. um, but you know when you're practicing with great players and you're stacking yourself up against them and you know you belong or that you're better than so and so um, in that highly competitive environment you have a high expectations for yourself right so I was really bummed out that Friday that I hadn't been picked. And so um, I don't know if I went out that night for, for beers or I don't know what I did. I, maybe I was home, but I just remember sleeping in the next day because mm -hmm. I was a little depressed. You know, you see players getting picked ahead of you and you just, you're like, you know, like what the hell, like, you know, what does that guy have that I don't yeah. kind of thing. And then I think it was around 10 30 in the morning when my mom came running into my bedroom going, Mark, Mark, you know, you were picked, you're drafted. Congratulations. And there, they actually found out before I did and woke me out of bed and I, they dragged me out and I was pretty excited about it. I went in the sixth round to, to Columbus and uh, you know, I was seeing other guys um, getting that had just been picked ahead of me and afterwards. And it felt really good. It was exciting. And I was happy. And uh, I got a lot of phone calls from relatives and, and friends and current teammates at the time were calling me to congratulate me as well. So that was pretty cool. But again, I was so competitive in my own mind that I, I was pissed off. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't like that lots of guys that I knew of had gone before me. And that was just the, the way I would, that was part of my makeup. Right. And even at that age, I still remember I'd, I'd write up little memos for myself and, and stick them up against, you know, against right above the door on my way out of the bedroom about work ethic in the summer. And I do little things like that to motivate myself. And I think that was part of my makeup and what made me so competitive and probably successful in the end was I just had a different drive and, and I, I never wanted to stop getting better. I never wanted to stop training. So um, that was all part of it. But yeah, I mean, going back to the draft, uh, it was exciting and, 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 and comforting knowing that all that work was starting to pay off. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was gonna say that that's probably a nice uh, sort of alarm clock there for you to get woken up and oh, by the way, you got drafted into the NHL. <laughs> yeah, oh, <sure. laughs> yeah. Wor worst ways to start your mornings. Yeah. Um, like making the jump, obviously, not only from OHL to AHL, but then AHL to NHL, there's little things that you've got to obviously add to your game and, you know, learning curves along the way. What, what were some of the biggest adjustments you found personally, you know, making the jump from junior to pro and then from pro to the NHL levels there? Well, when you're not playing, so when I made the jump to the American League level, I knew that coming right out of junior hockey, I'd end up playing in the AHL. I, mm -hmm. I knew I wasn't going to be in the NHL. I wasn't ready. 
So when I ended up in Syracuse after NHL training camp, first of all, training camp gives you a great idea once you're at the NHL level to see what you're missing and to see what you need to work on. You're watching all these other great players. And uh, so that kind of gave me a good idea what I needed to do going back down to Syracuse. But at the same time, it's, it's new, right? You're all of a sudden playing with like men, grown men who have families um, that have been playing in the AHL for, you know, you've got the life, the lifers that are, that are a little more grizzled and a little rougher around the edges that you're playing with as well. And you'll learn off these guys and they put you in your place right away. Um, you know, bad habits that you have, maybe practice ends, you try to get off the ice right away. No, nope, can't do that. Got to make sure all the pucks are off the ice. So you, you get, you, you learn all these new responsibilities and you go back to being treated like a rookie again. And I just won the Memorial cup in London. So, you know, I've got a chip on my shoulder. I think I'm really good. And, uh, but it's a wake up call and um, never mind all the responsibilities that you're, you're learning as a rookie, but you're also living on your own now, you know, mm-hmm. I have to rent it a condo and um, that's where having, you know, where I was lucky, at least having parents that were helping me out. They let me rent a Toyota Privia van. It's like a big silver spaceship looking van. Absolutely embarrassing, but they gave me wheels for a couple months. Yeah. So that allowed me to get around and, figure out where I wanted to live and do all that until I finally bought my own vehicle for myself. But um, yeah, it's a huge adjustment as anybody knows, getting thrown out there in the real world and not relying on your mom and dad anymore. Um, it, you grow up real fast. And I think the OHL was a really good, um, you know, bridge for that, but you can't, you can't replicate living on your own in a new city down in the States, no less. Um, so it was a really good learning experience for me and it taught me a lot of responsibility. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure it was running through your head a couple of times, pulling up to practice in that minivan there thinking, oh, oh I, I've really made I, it now. <laughs> drove. I had a, we had a first rounder. His name was Alex Picard at the time. And uh, he would drive with me to practice. And after games, we'd go to like down the street to like Applebee's or wherever we were having dinner after the game. And I still remember pulling up to a traffic light and he and my like my van had no tents. Yeah. And there were two girls driving beside us in another vehicle. And I remember him looking over at them and they were kind of smiling and laughing at us. We're in our suits in this awful looking van. <laughs> and I remember him just like cranking the seat back all the way back in reclining mode and then running into the back of the car to hide from them. And that was an example of how, you know, how we thought at that age. Like we actually cared what people thought when we were driving around. Obviously to this day, I could drive anything and I wouldn't care. But, yeah. you know, those are all learning experiences and it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you remember your first goal? Like what, what was going through your head when, when you finally saw you, you yourself tickle the twine at the NHL level for the first time? Oh man. Uh, that would have been when I was playing again, it was in Nashville. And I remember just the, the play was going up the ice and that's when I could really, really skate before I started having knee issues. <laughs> I beat everybody up the ice kind of a, as a third man high trailing over their offensive blue line. And I got a pass from, I think it was Manny Malholtra. And yeah, I kind of got lucky. It kind of deflected a little bit and went shelf. And um, I just remember feeling relief, you know, like especially as a D-man, a stay-at-home D-man, you just want to you just want to break uh, break the goose egg and and, and uh, uh, get it out of the way, and then it can kind of go from there. Because even as a D-man, you stress that you don't want to have a donut on the stat sheet all year. So yeah. it felt really good, gave me some newfound confidence, and I was able to grow from there. Yeah, yeah. What was uh, going through your mind when you found out that not only had you been traded, but you were actually traded to your hometown and we're coming back to Ottawa? Oh, it was great. It was actually on Canada Day. And uh, I remember we're, I was having a party, a big Canada Day outdoor party at my house. I don't know, like 30, 40 people or whatever that was. And that was, we were setting up for it. People were going to start rolling in around, uh, you know, one, two o'clock or whatever it was. And at noon was when free agency opened up and teams were allowed to start making trades again. Mm-hmm. So I had no idea until I was just randomly checking Twitter. Twitter was just starting to get really big around that time in 2012. Like, yeah. you know, it had been around obviously years prior, but I'd, I'd been starting to use it more and, and, and news was starting to travel faster on Twitter than it was on TV, right? Mm-hmm. So I remember updating the feed and seeing Bob McKenzie post something about me being traded and that it was official. And I'm thinking like, no one's even called me yet, but that's how fast the news traveled. Right. Yeah. And knowing Bob McKenzie, he was on the ball before anybody else was. So yeah, um, yeah I, I saw the announcement officially made on, on, on Twitter. And then I got a call from Brian Murray. And then uh, at the time, Scott Housen, our GM in, 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 uh, in Columbus. And it, the timing couldn't have been better. Right. Cause I was elated. Like, like, 
it was insane how I, I'd, I'd never felt that before. It would have been, it was a dream of mine to play for the Sens. Yeah. And um, we were able to celebrate with friends all day there at the house. It was awesome. It couldn't have been a better timing and situation. So uh, that's a day, oddly enough, completely almost unhockey related, unrelated to hockey, I mean, because uh, we weren't at the rink or anything, but it's probably one of the most memorable, memorable moments of my career. Yeah, yeah. Go figure. Eh? Good old Bob breaking the news to you before your own GM does, eh? Incredible, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, I mean... <sighs> Were you aware that they had sort of been kicking the tires on you for a while? Because, you know, obviously after the fact reports came out that, oh, they had actually tried to trade for you a couple of times. Well, no, I had no idea because at that time, um, it's funny, the, the last shift I had as a Blue Jacket leading up to that was months before the end of the season because I'd broken my jaw, took mm -hmm. a slap shot to the jaw and it broke in two spots. So I couldn't play and we were completely out of the playoffs. So instead of coming back maybe a week to play like three games, I just stayed yeah. off. And, um, and then that summer, I, I got invited to play at the World Championships. So I was, I was playing at the World Championships with this huge fishbowl covering my entire face, protecting me. And I had a very good tournament playing with all these other pretty good NHL players. And I was kind of an unknown guy coming out of Columbus. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing a scout. I think it was an Ottawa scout on the plane. I don't even want to drop his name. I don't even know if this is allowed, but I kind of just – Talked to him a little bit and said, yeah, I mean, I'd love to play in Ottawa kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if that had anything to do with the trade, but um, sure, sure enough, eh, like a couple months later, I get, I get traded there. So, um, you know, as a Blue Jacket getting hurt that last shift of my broken jaw, it kind of just sealed the deal, I guess, and I was gone. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, while we're talking about it, you, you had your fair share of painful injuries over the year whether it was you know the pinky the knees the jaws the which one was maybe not the the most you know painful in the moment but the most frustrating to try and play through and, and come back I had a really bad back my contract year in Ottawa I remember the nerve pain I was getting all the way up and down my leg and back right starting in your butt area too and or your sciatic <laughs> there then it was all sciatic nerve pain and it was probably because I had a bit of a herniation mm -hmm in my back and in one of the discs. And uh, that was hard because you can't really, I think the timing of it looked really bad too. Cause people maybe think, Oh, maybe he's just holding out. He doesn't want to play or whatever it was. And it couldn't be farther from the truth. Cause I'm playing in my hometown. Mm -hmm. I want nothing but to have a good reputation here. And uh, that was frustrating because you couldn't really see it, but then we'd see doctors and we do the, all the MRIs and stuff and they could see that there was an issue, but that was really frustrating because I could barely get out of bed in the morning. And then I'd be taking painkillers just to try to practice. Same thing with my knee, very similar with the knee. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was taking Toradol in, in training camp. You know, just when you're taking Toradol in training camp, what is that telling you? You know, so that's when you should be your, your most fresh, your healthiest. And that kind of was an indicator to me that it was probably coming to an end, which was hard for me to stomach because I always took such great pride in taking good care of myself and training really hard. And, um, you know, being told no by your body when your mind is saying, yes, just keep yeah. playing. A very conflicting uh, thing to go through and um, you know there's times now even when I'm still in denial and I have a hard time watching TV you know when I'm watching the games because I feel like I can still play out there and I still take great care of myself but I have a defect and that's something that I have to learn to live with. Yeah yeah well I mean hey on your hand you you threw out your back playing at the NHL level I threw out my back this summer <laughs> landscaping my backyard so you know <laughs> Yeah, apples to apples, clearly, I, right? <laughs> we'll do that. So I get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, you, you, you finally get the news. You're, you're coming back to your hometown. You're, you're going to start the season with the Sens there. You know, did, did everyone and their grandmother that you ever knew growing up all of a sudden start reaching out and trying to hit you up for tickets? Or oh. what was it like for that first game that you were going to be putting on the Sens jersey? Well, and that's added stress, right, as a player. I know people don't maybe always understand but when you're playing, or at least when I was playing, I was always so focused on just hockey, right? So all that extra, that extra curricular stuff going on around you, um, it can be a distraction. And, um, you know, as a player playing with all that stress and pressure, you can become very fragile mentally if you're not managing it properly. And so that was the stressor. And, and so I, I had my dad actually kind of intervene and he was dealing with all the, you know, all the family members, anybody that wanted to go to games, they would go to him and he would coordinate with one of the people through the team. So that way I wasn't worried about it. I was just, you know, I'd get up in the morning on a game day and I was just focused on the game and that was it. I didn't want to worry about getting tickets for John's 
John jo, John Doe or you know somebody else in the family that wanted to go. So uh, he became your de facto got, ticket broker then, essentially. Yeah, well, and it's true. <laughs> and then you've got all your friends. Yeah. Those buds that exp and people just think you can get tickets for free, right? Yeah. Like, little do people know that as a player, you're only allotted two per game, mm -hmm. and that goes to your mom and dad. Never mind your wife or your kids, yeah. and then and you're paying for all those people, and it's like a hundred plus dollars a ticket, and then so all these people always just expected to get freebies and stuff. And I think over time, as the years went on, they just realized, ah, Mark's a lost cause. I can't get any free. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's kind of how it works. Yeah, yeah. You know, looking back on your time in Ottawa, are there one or two moments that maybe stand out as extra special to you? Like, like what do you remember your most about your time as a Sen? I remember the playoff rounds, um, you know, playing against Montreal, playing against New York, playing against Pittsburgh. Um, those are going to stick out to me just because of the support we were getting from all the fans. And it was crazy. Like, we'd get, we'd fly in and land in between games during a round or after we won a round and you'd see all the fans lined up at the airport, for example, like a huge lineup of people. And um, it, it's hard to put, it's hard to put words to what that makes you feel, but the pride that you get from it and the boost, the confidence booster and just those feel good feelings that you get um, is something I can't really replicate anywhere else. And um, so those for me are probably going to stand out the most um, because they were successful moments as a team and the fans were rallying behind us and everything was going great. So absolutely all the playoff rounds that we won will definitely stand out to me. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously Vegas joins the league. You have to have the expansion draft there, you know, heading into it that there were, okay, which direction is the team going to go this way, that way, who are they going to protect? Were, were you sort of told ahead of time that, you know, hey, by the way, this is sort of the direction we're going. There's a chance Vegas might take you. Or were you kind of surprised by the fact that you weren't protected? How, how did that whole process sort of play out? Well, leading into it, I kind of had a good idea right away because what was going to happen? Because we had Eric Carlson, who was obviously going to be protected. Mm -hmm. Cody Cece, who I guess, in my opinion, was obviously going to be protected. He was significantly younger than I am and tons of upside or whatever. So he was a no-brainer. And then he had Dion. But Dion had a, a no trade clause. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he was obviously immediately protected unless he waived it. So that was three, your three allotted positions on D that were allowed to get protected. So I'm not dumb. I just did the math and figured, okay, I'm going to probably get picked here, I think. And, um, um, you know, I had a conversation with Pierre and I didn't want to put pressure on the team. I just said, listen, I understand what's happening here. And, uh, you know, I'll accept any fate that comes my way. And, so be it, you know, and, and, and I didn't want to put pressure on Dion. So in fact, cause I know that he was getting pressure to waive his no trade from some people. And mm -hmm. I actually called Dion and I told him like, listen, you don't owe me anything. You've earned your no trade clause. That's your, you've earned that. Do not waive that for anybody, including myself, you know, and he appreciated the phone call cause it took a little pressure off him. And I didn't want him thinking about that every day. And mm -hmm. maybe he wasn't, but it sounded like he was appreciative of that call. So you know, from that moment on, I had a new a good idea. I was gone. I didn't know that I, I didn't, I didn't assume that I was going to get traded to, to Dallas from Vegas. But the moment I had the first, my first conversation with that Kelly McCrimmon from, from Vegas, mm -hmm. he kind of, it was a weird call where he was, didn't seem very eager to have me on board. It was more asking me how I was doing and if I was willing to uh, send them a no trade list. So right then and there, I thought, okay, shit, I'm not going to end up in, in Vegas. Yeah. which is a shame because I was looking forward to that. Um, and I certainly like the tax plan there, unlike Ontario. <laughs> so um, sure, sure enough, I'm sitting at the keg with my wife and my in-laws. We're having dinner maybe five or six days after the fact that Vegas called me. And uh, it was uh, uh, Jim Neal from Dallas, the general manager. And we had a great conversation, told me that, that they had traded for me and um, I couldn't have been happier. Like, again, a great organization with a ton of history, uh, a lot of experience winning and a no state tax. So I thought this is perfect. The money's there, the uh, culture, the hockey culture is there and it's a great place to live. And it's a, it's a stark contrast from where we live here in Ontario, in Ottawa. So uh, we were excited for it and it turned out to be great. Aside from my injury, they took great care of us. And uh, what a first class organization. I, can't, I cannot speak uh, more highly of them. Yeah, yeah. So, well, that was going to be my question, right, is, you know, were you mentally preparing yourself to, you know, 
okay, I, I'm a golden knight now. Let's start looking up who my, you know, potential teammates are all going to be. Or right from the get-go, based on that conversation with the GM, you, you sort of had in your mind that, you know what, like I got selected by them, but there, there's not really yeah. much of a chance that I'm playing for them. No, yeah, no, exactly. Just like I touched on earlier, I, there, I knew right away, just based off my conversation yeah. with them, I could kind of read that. Uh, you know, read in between the lines that I wasn't going to end up there. So I didn't even bother do any research on them. I didn't care. I didn't care for it. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was looking forward to finding out who I was going to. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously. And on that note, when they did ask me for my no trade list, I was allowed to put, I think, cause it was in my contract that I'd signed with Ottawa. I was allowed to pick 10 teams. So I picked mm -hmm. every single Canadian team. Mm -hmm. I can talk about it now. I never, I didn't want to at the time, uh, but I picked every Canadian team um, except for maybe was it Vancouver I think because at least, you know, you know, you're paying a lot there still, but at the same time, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I picked every New York team because of the tax bracket there. And I picked every California team. Mm -hmm. Those were my 10 teams. It was purely based on money. Mm -hmm. And I can say that wholeheartedly now without a care in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, it's probably also nice to, you know, be mid February and there you are down in Dallas, Texas, and it's you know 30 degrees. People don't get it. People yeah. don't get the advantage these teams have because yeah. We, when we're going down there for a road trip and you're coming from minus what's what minus 17 here today. Yeah. And you're paying 55% taxes. Mm -hmm. And then you go down there and you're paying 38%, which is a lot of money when it comes to the amount you're making in a short period of time in our short careers. Mm -hmm. Never mind the fact that it might be plus 15 in mm -hmm. Texas around that time of year. So you get off the plane and you get this like gust of warm air hitting in the face. It's even better. <laughs> for yeah. And you, Oh, these lucky pricks, you know, like <laughs> I can't get over the fact that they're like, what a dream it would be to play here. And that was what a lot of us thought. And that's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we've got obviously a big event coming up world juniors and uh, you know, while you didn't necessarily participate in the world juniors, you did actually get to be on team Canada twice for two world hockey championships there, you know, yeah. For, for someone who has grown up playing hockey their whole life, but has never represented their country, you know, what is that feeling like putting on that Team Canada jersey for the first time? Oh, it was awesome. It was yeah. awesome. I still remember that first camp that I'd gone for camp, that first tournament I went to for the, the world championships after that season in Columbus before I was traded. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like, and it's, it's the way they take care of you. Um, you get there and they, they seal off an entire floor and, you have this massive ballroom down there that they've completely turned over into like, you know, with Canadian flags everywhere. And they make it very comfortable with TVs and Xboxes and uh, great food. Like they really go above and beyond to take care of you and make you comfortable because you're gone for a month. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then you're around excellent hockey players with, you know, ex greats that are running the team. So you see guys like Rob Blake walking around and you're just like, Oh my God, this is awesome. Yeah. And, uh, get to talk to these people and you get to pick brains, right? Like I was playing with, with tons of all-stars at the time and you get to see how they carry themselves in practice, their preparation, what they do to get better, how they eat. Um, all that stuff is great for a young player like myself at the time mm -hmm. uh, to kind of feed off of and learn from. And um, it's, it's an incredible feeling to represent your country. You have this sense of pride when you put on the Jersey and, certainly when you step out on the ice and warm-ups and you know you're with team canada and uh it's a really great feeling and those are some really memorable moments for me in my career yeah, yeah. You, you almost revert to being a kid again even though you're you're a grown man at that time. and it's not on the level that you would be when you're playing in the olympics i understand that certainly maybe not even comparable to the world juniors it's not the same stage uh because you know the viewership's not even close to the same but nevertheless you're playing with first class players and yeah it's it reminds you, it brings you back to playing, you know, NHL 94, when you can go to that international mode and play for yeah. Team Canada or North America or whatever it was. And um, it, it's a pretty neat feeling. Yeah, play with all the 99 overall players there and then you go up again, <laughs> exactly. yeah, and just, just yeah. wax them. <laughs> I just rinse my younger brother when he's playing with like Pittsburgh or something and I've got Team Canada. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you know, I've got Lemieux on my team. Yeah, well, he's also on my team and I've got the entire <laughs> Eastern Conference All-Stars here. Yeah, with line mates like Gretzky, you know, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. awesome. Do, do you have any predictions of how uh, this, this year's World Juniors are going to go? You're asking the wrong guy. I have no idea. <laughs> I haven't even been watching TSN. Um, it's funny, eh? Without the sports, I'm actually starting to pick up on it again now with the NBA coming back. But yeah, um, yeah I haven't been following much. 
So I don't even know, you know, who the favorites are and where we stand. I'm assuming we're up there. But yeah. Right. Now, I have no idea. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us and, uh, you know, talk about your career and your time in Ottawa and all, all, all your time in the show as well, too, there. And we wish yeah. you all the best heading into the holiday season. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Kyle. Appreciate it.